I'm Ashley Ross and uh, um, I'm a urologist right now practicing in, in Dallas, uh, soon to be moving up to Chicago. Uh, my background is that uh, I had an MD-PhD and then I did residency and uh, stayed on faculty at Johns Hopkins. I had a clinical focus and a research focus of prostate cancer and was involved in prostate cancer genomics for a while. Um, had integrated with molecular companies like uh, Decipher uh, early on and did some work um, with them in development and it's been nice for me to see that come into my clinic. What we sort of knew from retrospective data but Raves and Radical confirmed is that for patients with um, intermediate grade cancers um, that do not have seminal vesicle involvement, do not have lymph node positivity, um, those patients, you know, likely are going to be safe for early salvage type approaches. And that's what, that, that's what those studies confirmed to me, that I wasn't harming my patients by waiting till I started to see a PSA of about 0.1 um, to radiate that. And that's what I'm talking about, the Gleason grade group 2 or grade group 3 patient with a positive margin, or the Gleason grade group 2 or 3 patient with extra prostatic extension. Uh, those, those patients, if we did adjuvant from previous studies, we, they would, we would think that there might be an over-treatment rate of about 90%. Um, Raves and radicals kind of helped solidify that, you know, we were probably over-treating those patients if we gave them radiation. The issue is, um, what do you do with a person with multiple um, adverse pathologic features? The Gleason 8 to 10 patients with um, seminal vesicle invasion. The Gleason, you know, um, 8 to 10 patients um, with a pos positive margin in EPE. And how do you, what do you do with these patients that are at slightly higher risk and were underrepresented in the Raves and Radical trials? For those patients, there's still a question mark. You know, those are at the highest risk. What we do kind of at least I think there's signals of this as the disease gets out of the pelvis, uh, meaning it's beyond pelvic lymph nodes, um, you're starting to look at containment rather than curability. Um, but I do think that there are some opportunities, at least from retrospective data, for cure with salvage or adjuvant radiation. And what we know from some of the PSMA data, which is PET data that's more sensitive for imaging, is that as you track patients over different PSA levels after local therapy, as the PSA starts to get above 0.2, et cetera, you start to see extra pelvic disease. And so I think you want to be early on these patients. And so in my practice, I'm looking in the ultra-sensitive PSA levels. In the ultra-sensitive PSA levels, you can, there can be noise from the assay. And so levels that are in the, you know, below 0.03 are suspect. Um, there can be benign tissue that's maybe left towards the bladder neck that may or may not be aggressive. Um, and you know, you wonder, are you, with raves and radicals, are you radiating too early in some of those patients? Did that patient not really have any metastatic potential? Are you radiating too early? And that's where I think it, you, you really can benefit from um, some molecular insight um, to see, well, what is the potential of this disease to go from curable to a containment kind of strategy? What is the potential of this disease to get out of the pelvis such that if I don't act now and I wait you know, for the PSA to become 0.1, I'm going to be acting too late? What we found in, in many, many assays retrospective is that molecular data um, has independent prognostic abilities to, to identify that disease that's going to be at highest risk of metastasis, beyond that Gleason, beyond if it's already gotten to the seminal vesicles or not, et cetera. And the assay that it sort of um, has been most established in that, in that realm is the, is the Decipher RP assay. Um, and so that is where I use it in my practice. So, I, so, I, so, I, so Radicals and Raves has confirmed for me what I already know. And I think the black box is still, well, what, what do I want to do in that, in that ultra-sensitive range of PSAs um, for patients with these, with these um, bad features. Um, and radicals raves is going to be a little bit of buffer that says that, you know, I'm, I may be safe in some of them to wait, but, you know, I know from my clinical acumen and from the literature out there that I want to be proactive in a subgroup. And that, pro that subgroup for me is the decipher high risk, so the GC scores of 0.6 and above. And there was a uh, nice paper a few years ago where um, um, Decipher uh, group and other investigators uh, tried to establish which patients seem to most benefit from adjuvant radiation. And they, it all sort of boiled down to a risk count. You know, if you were like Gleason 8 to 10 and you had a Decipher of 0.6 and higher, or you had SVI, 
or you had like lymph node positivity, if you had like any two of those risk factors, it seemed like you benefited a lot more from what they defined as adjuvant in that, which was I think less than 0.1 in that, in that study. And so for those patients, when I look at that kind of easy risk factor thing in my practice, I'll tell them if you're 0.03 on the ultrasensitive or above, I really suggest we do adjuvant. I've had a few patients that have been even more proactive and have ultrasensitive PSAs that are undetectable and still said, look, my decipher is high risk and I want to do adjuvant. Um, time will tell. I think radicals and raves, as many trials before it, have um, stimulated the need for another trial, which would be higher risk patients in the, you know, with ultrasensitive data. And that trial should definitely be stratified by, um, the, by the molecular um, um, components as well. But it also gives me buffers for safety. So there, there are certain genomic classifier levels in the low risk range where there's good data that um, from experiences at Johns Hopkins and other places with long-term fault data that there's never any metastatic events. And, that, and that's a patient where I may buffer out all the way to 0.2 or more before I'm thinking about uh, radiation treatment. And it gives the patient a lot of confidence too that we can do two things. One, not worry about the PSA fluctuations as much in the ultrasensitive range, and in fact, even omit the ultrasensitive PSA testing. Um, my, I would say that I'm a little bit forward-facing in my use of the ultrasensitive PSA assay. A lot of groups still rely on conventional you know, PSAs. But uh, in those cases, you would even more want to do genomics so that you might use that ultrasensitive PSA as an adjunct. Mm -hmm.